sorry for this. Um, so uh, again, I'm David Dineze, hi everyone. And thank you for letting me present here. Um, I'm from, I'm a master student from the Institute of Astronomy at KU Leuven. And uh, I would like now to discuss a little bit about the uh, long secondary periods uh, of uh, evolved stars. And in particular about the hypothesis that these stars are actually uh, part of a binary system uh, in which the companion is hidden in a dust uh, cloud orbiting around. So let me make first a super brief introduction about wh what we mean by uh, evolved stars. Uh, these stars usually have radii up to several uh, astronomical units, and they are usually characterized by quite important mass loss. Um, they also present winds that are shaping the circumstellar envelopes. As we can see in the figure in the, on the right-hand side, we have the star in the middle and um, this sort of bubble uh, envelope around. Um, and these stars are also usually characterized by uh, pulsation, at least in the later stages of their evolution, uh, both on the red giant branch and on the asymptotic red giant branch. Uh, now, the long secondary periods, which is the phenomenon we are trying to study now, uh, and basically consists in these periodic oscillation, oscillations in luminosity. And uh, as the name suggests, uh, these periods are usually quite long, uh, about 10 times longer than the pulsation periods. And the origin behind this uh, pulsation is still unknown. Uh, they are actually quite common. Uh, they, are, uh, they are observed in about one third of the uh, evolved, evolved objects. Uh, so when we talk about stellar, stellar variability, um, we can usually identify a relationship between the period of the oscillations that we observe and the luminosity of the star itself. And if we look at the graph on the right hand side here, uh, we have the luminosity on the y axis and the period on the x axis. And um, as we can see, uh, most of the um, oscillations that we observe fall into one of these sequences. Uh, and it is important to notice that one star can present uh, more than one period, so it can oscillate with more than one frequency, and uh, therefore it can be uh, depicted more than once in this graph. Um, uh, the long secondary periods, which is what we are trying to study here, uh, is forming this sequence uh, D here on the right hand side, uh, which obviously stays at uh, longest period at the longest periods. Um, we already know the origin of all the other kind of oscillations uh, in, uh, in stellar variability. Uh, the only uh, sequence we don't know the origin is uh, indeed the sequence D. So um, a little bit of the properties of these long secondary periods. Uh, they have a duration of usually between 200 and 1400 days. Uh, they can have quite large amplitudes up to almost one magnitude. Uh, and it's important to notice that they are always observed together with another primary pulsation mode. So there is no star that is only presenting these uh, long secondary periods. They are also always oscillating uh, with another frequency too. And this uh, other uh, primary pulsation mode uh, is not affected uh, by the phase of the long secondary period, uh, not its period or uh, its amplitude uh, changes. Um, the long secondary periods are also not always there in the life of the evolved star, but they tend to appear only in the later stages, uh, usually um, at the same time at the formation of uh, a stable outflow from the star. So if we take a closer look uh, to the light curves of this star, we can see that they usually present a quite a steep decrease in the light curve and the slower increase. So they have this kind of uh, asymmetric uh, light curve. Uh, people also observed that uh, they tend to be not regular. So at different cycles, the depth of this oscillation can uh, vary. Um, instead, if we look at the um, radial velocities of these stars, uh, they have usually uh, radial velocity amplitudes of around 3, 3.5 kilometers per second. And um, again, uh, also in the radial velocity curves, we observe this asymmetric shape in which, you have, in which we have a, a quick increase in the radial velocity and then a slower decrease. Uh, now, the origin uh, behind this phenomenon, uh, these uh, long secondary periods have been studied for quite a few years and uh, they, they have been made uh, several hypotheses. One of them is that they are just caused by pulsations as the other oscillations. Uh, if this was the case, uh, we would have to exclude the uh, radial modes because as we said, 
we are looking at periods longer than the fundamental mode. So um, they would uh, need to be non-radial modes, convective non-radial modes. Uh, there are a few problems with this hypothesis. Uh, for example, these modes tend to have quite smaller amplitudes that, than the one we are looking at. Uh, and um, we wouldn't really be able to reproduce the shape of the light curves uh, with possessions. And also, um, they observed um, some sort of non-spherically symmetric distribution of dust around these stars, uh, which couldn't be explained by possessions. Um, so now this brings us to uh, the hypothesis that, that, that we would like to um, investigate now, uh, the binary hypothesis. Uh, it, is, it was presented already quite a few years ago, and it basically says that these stars are actually part of a binary system, uh, and there is a companion orbiting around and uh, um, focusing the outflows from the primary. Uh, and in certain cases, uh, this companion can also accrete material from the uh, primary star. Uh, a few points in favor to this hypothesis. Um, well, for example, over the years, people uh, have observed uh, if we look at the right, um, the right hand side picture here, um, people have observed a smaller secondary eclipse here on the bottom uh, in the infrared. But this smaller eclipse is not uh, observed in the optical. So this would correspond to the phase of the orbit when the secondary is hiding behind the, prim behind the primary. Um, and so this emission in, uh, in the infrared is actually coming from the dust that uh, is uh, surrounding the companion. Uh, and uh, when looking at the spectral energy distribution, people also observed uh, infrared excess. And this could be caused by the fact that optical light is actually absorbed by the dust surrounding the primary. Um, there are also uh, obviously a few problems with this hypothesis too. Uh, for example, uh, the so-called brown dwarf desert. So here the idea is that um, if we look at binary system with uh, main sequence stars, we see a lot of giant planets, but not as many brown dwarfs. Uh, but if we uh, look at the radial velocities um, of the stars in which we see long secondary periods, we would expect uh, these stars to have brown dwarf as companions uh, due to the expected mass. Uh, but we don't have uh, that many brown dwarfs in binary system. So one solution to this problem could be that actually uh, these companions were indeed planets and they accreted material from the primary uh, up to reaching the mass uh, that is typical of a brown dwarf. Um, the issue with the shape of the light curves could be actually easily explained by the fact that these um, dust clouds around the uh, orbiting around um, are actually uh, are assuming a comet shape uh, tail. And so this could uh, explain the slower increase in the light curves. Uh, there are still unsolved issues with this hypothesis. For example, uh, if we assume indeed uh, that these are binary system, then from the radial velocities, we can compute eccentricities. And we observe quite high eccentricities, we, which cannot really be explained. Uh, and also, we can compute the angle of periestron of the orbit. And we would expect a random distribution of these angles. But instead, we see an asymmetric distribution towards high angles. Um, so I must say that the project I'm working on, it's still ongoing and we don't really have results uh, yet, not final results. But the main out outline includes uh, collecting observations mainly in the infrared. Uh, we are now creating 3D hydrodynamical simulations modeling this binary system. And from, which, from these simulations, we will be able to derive um, abundance profiles and other observational features to be compared with the, uh, with the observations. Um, we already have data for this one star, which is called RTPAD. Uh, it's a red giant. Um, the uh, data uh, were collected with the instrument Pioneer at the VLTI. And again, I must stress this, that the data reduction is not uh, complete yet, and we just have a very preliminary result. But um, they have already observed some kind of uh, non-point symmetry for distances between 1 and 1.4. 1.5 uh, astronomical units, uh, which could kind of correspond to what we are expecting to be the uh, orbital separation of our system. Um, so how do we plan to actually compare the simulations to the observations? Well, uh, in our simulation, we are using as input all the parameters of a, of a binary system, such as star masses, separation, and so on. And we are also including outflows from the primary uh, with different ranges of wind speed and mass loss. 
and uh, uh, from the simulations, we would like to retrieve quantities like gas density, gas to dust ratio, opacity of the dust, uh, which obviously depends on the uh, sides of the grains, uh, the column density of the cloud, which uh, obviously accounts for the shape uh, that the cloud is assuming around the star, and temperature on the dust of the dust and the gas. Um, obviously, the simulations that we are creating uh, do not only have to agree with the observations that we are doing, but also uh, to observational features that we get from the literature. For example, the uh, already mentioned uh, asymmetrical shape of the light curves. So here is a video uh, showing a simulation of an HB star with a companion orbiting around. This simulation was done by uh, our group in the previous years. And if we can zoom into the center and uh, uh, we can see what we are kind of trying to retrieve with our simulation. Uh, and uh, we can see the outflow coming from the primary star and part of the outflow is getting accreted here to the secondary. Uh, and then uh, due to orbital motion, uh, we have that uh, the rest of the outflow can be uh, shaped into these spiral arms that can expand further out from the system. So here is where Karma Alma can come into play. Uh, if we could observe this system with Alma, well, first of all, uh, by uh, observing the surrounding of the system, we would be definitely able to um, indeed confirm that we are looking at a binary system. And thanks to Alma Angular Resolution, we could be uh, able to resolve um, the structures that are forming in the circumbinary wind around the system. Obviously, we are looking at this system edge on, so uh, it would do it would look um, like something like uh, what is depicted here in this simulation. But uh, as you can see, uh, arcs and like spiral arms that are uh, going uh, outwards are clearly visible from the simulation. Um, and with Alma, we would also be able to uh, make some kind of uh, statistical analysis, um, quantitative analysis, uh, for example, retrieving parameters like orbital separation and secondary mass. Uh, so now to summarize, we have seen that uh, long secondary periods are indeed quite common um, in uh, evolved stars, but their origin is still debated. And we are trying to prove the binary hypothesis. Under this hypothesis, um, we have a, a, a companion orbiting around this evolved star. And the companion is indeed invisible because it's hidden in a very dense dust cloud. Uh, we already have observations from the VLTI uh, from which we were able to confirm the presence of uh, some sort of asymmetric uh, dust cloud around the star. We are now uh, creating this 3D hydrodynamical simulation uh, to which we will apply radiative transfer and we will then create uh, synthetic observations to be compared with the actual observations. And uh, um, by the use of ALMA, uh, we would be definitely able to resolve uh, larger scale structures that are typical of a binary system. And I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. It was so well within time. Um, do we already have a, a widget? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, hi, thank you so much for the great talk. Uh, I had a very simple question. In your first uh, light curve that you showed, uh, along with the long-term uh, uh, kind of oscillations that you see, there are also quite a few short, uh, I think, yeah, here or you see also quite a few short-term uh, oscillations. Uh, do you know yes. what is the origin of those? I might have missed. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So um, as I was mentioning, these long secondary periods are these uh, longer, longer uh, oscillations and also higher in depth, so um, with higher magnitudes. And the shorter one are due to pulsations because as I mentioned already, um, all these stars that are showing these uh, oscillations are also oscillating um, with another period, which is usually about 10 times shorter. So these shorter oscillation uh, are indeed due to pulsation because all the stars we are looking at are um, evolved star. So towards the end of the, usually towards the end of the asymptotic giant branch. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, there's a question in the chat from Sebastian. Is there a way to directly image the hidden companion or will it always be invisible, only revealed by its effects on the surroundings? So um, the idea is that um, these companions have never been imaged because indeed if they are there, they are usually a very, very large planet or sub dwarf or uh, brown dwarf. So not very luminous. And most of all, they are hidden in these 
I mean, the idea is that they are hidden in this uh, dust cloud. So they cannot be directly imaged. Um, one way we are trying to achieve this is uh, with the VLTI. Um, the resolution of VLTI, the angular resolution should allow us to kind of um, see the dust um, uh, next to the companion. So the idea, this is just a very first reconstruction, but I, I think they have already been working on this more. So the idea is to see some kind of emission from the dust next to the star. But exactly the companion could not be uh, uh, imaged, probably. Thanks. Um, I had a follow-up question because I'm not clear on the ALMA observations that you were mentioning. So is this a program that's already been approved and is that targeting particular spectral line or dust? Um, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, uh, this was just an idea um, that we had. Uh, because with VLTI, we are looking at the very uh, at the orbital region, so where the two systems are. But what we could achieve with ALMA is looking at the larger structures. So uh, since, as I mentioned, we have quite important outflows. Mm -hmm. And uh, in case of a, of a companion, this would uh, shape the outflows quite importantly. So with ALMA, we could uh, actually resolve these structures. And also, the companion should affect the uh, velocity of the outflows and create this sort of, um, uh, how is it called, enhancement of density on the, on the plane, orbital plane. Um, and uh, the idea, so I know that this star in particular have already been, has already been observed uh, in CO emissions. Mm -hmm and they've already measured uh, the winds, but with very low resolution with ALMA. Uh, so the idea is to do it again, uh, but with higher resolution. OK, but again, targeting CO. Uh, I think so, yes. OK, thank you.